Thank you, Troy, for that good song service. And again, we do appreciate everyone being here this morning. Glad that you could come out and join us for our worship service here. Well, as you can see from the slide, and as has been mentioned already, this is Memorial Day weekend. And Memorial Day is an important holiday, uh, not just because people get off work, not because we get to see family and friends, not because we get to barbecue and swim or do whatever uh, the other things that we do on this weekend. Those things are nice. But Memorial Day is important because of what it's about. And I think too often we forget that. Memorial Day began after the Civil War as a day to recognize the fallen soldiers who died fighting for what they believed in on both sides, the Confederacy and the Union. It was originally called Decoration Day because families would decorate the graves of the fallen soldiers with flowers, flags, and ribbons. Uh, later on, it became tradition to put poppies uh, on those graves. It didn't become an official federal holiday until 1971, though. And it's important that we don't forget those who have given their lives in the service to their country. In the American Revolution, there were about 8,000 men lost. In the Civil War, over 490,000 men died. World War II, 53,402. I'm sorry, that was World War I. World War II, 291,557. The Korean War, 30,880. Vietnam, around 58,000. And in wars and conflicts since Vietnam, we've lost over 10,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And so we have a Memorial Day to remind us of all of those lives lost. Each one of those men and women wanted to live their lives just as badly as you or I do. They probably wanted to raise families, live in nice homes, have kids and a dog maybe. They had dreams, plans, and hopes for their futures. And so we should remember them and honor them. That's why Memorial Day was created, to help us remember the high cost of freedom, the high cost of fighting for freedom. But unfortunately, a lot of folks don't remember, even though we have this national holiday. To many, it's not about the lost lives. It's about getting a day off work or backyard barbecues or sales at your favorite store. The purpose of the holiday seems to be forgotten. But you know, as Bible-believing people, as children of God, that shouldn't be surprising because a lot of people forget about God as well. That's what I want to talk about this morning. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, open in the Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, I want to read a passage there, verses 11 through 19, that talks about what happens when we forget. Now this is addressed to the children of Israel as they are about to go into the promised land after they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. You recall God had brought them out of slavery in Egypt. He had promised to take them into this promised land, into the land of Israel. They did not trust Him enough though, and so that generation was condemned to wander in the wilderness until they died, and the next generation was allowed to go in. So after 40 years, Moses is reminding the people about what they need to do when they get into the promised land. And that's what he's talking about here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. He says there, Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions, scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God, and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. 
I really think that one of the biggest problems that the modern day church, that we as modern Christians face today, is that we are a forgetful people. We forget that God is God. We forget that He is sovereign, that He is almighty, that He's in control. We forget that Jesus is Lord, that He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. We forget that God's Word is authoritative and that it's through His Word that God saves us, changes us, sanctifies us, matures us, transforms us. I want to share a quote here with you. It says, The majority of Americans claim to be Christian, and only a small percentage claim to be actual atheists. But the truth is, many within the church are functional atheists. In other words, they would never say that they do not believe in God, but they live their lives like there is no God. Truly, they profess Christ with their lips, but their hearts are far from Him. Now think about that for a second. Think about what you know about atheists. Atheists don't pray, and neither do functional atheists, if you'll allow me to use that term this morning, or Christian atheists. Even though they say there's a God, they don't pray. They don't pray like they should. Their behavior doesn't line up with their profession. Atheists don't believe in the authority of God's Word, and neither do functional atheists. Now, they might say they believe it's God's Word, but it doesn't rule their lives. Atheists don't believe in laying up treasures in heaven, and neither do functional atheists. They're too busy seeking all their treasures here on the earth. Atheists only live for themselves and for today. Functional atheists... Or no difference. Now, here's the difference. Atheists believe there is no God. A functional atheist says he believes in God, but his life shows that he really doesn't believe it. Basically, the functional atheist is trying to hedge his bets just in case. He's become aware of the possibility that there is a God, there might be a God. He's aware of the possibility that God is real, and so he's trying to play the odds and cover all his bases. But the problem is, as we know, it doesn't work that way. Jesus doesn't give us the option of riding that fence, so to speak. In fact, Jesus says just the opposite. Those who are not with me are against me. He says, if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. He says, you can't serve two masters. All throughout the New Testament, he makes this distinction. He separates the sheep from the goats. He separates the wheat from the chaff. He says, this is my church, my body, and this over here isn't. So basically, the functional atheist is someone who has forgotten God. Now, we understand what it means to forget something or someone. It means that that thing or that person is not in our thoughts. They're not in our mind. And that happens when other things take their place. When other things push them out of the forefront of our mind. We've set our minds, our thoughts, our desires on those other things. And we disregard the thoughts of the thing that we need to be thinking about, that person. That's what the functional atheist does. Monday through Saturday, the thoughts of God don't cross their mind. The thoughts of living for Christ, learning about Him, loving Him, worshiping, are there only one day a week. But the rest of the week, their hearts are far from Him. And here's the thing. This is something that we all have to be watchful for. You, me, every other Christian. Look back at that passage in Deuteronomy there. Look at verse 11. God says this to His people. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God. In other words, he's saying, be careful that this doesn't happen to you. Take precautions that you're not forgetting God. But look at the last part of that verse. God says, take care so you don't forget. And here's how you do that. By keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. How do you forget God? By not keeping His commandments, His rules, His statutes. And he goes on and says, take care that you don't forget God, because when life is good, <coughs> excuse me, and things are going well, and you're comfortable and content with your place in life, you'll be tempted 
to forget about God. Now, I put this picture up here because I was trying to find something that represented the good life. And to me, that would be the good life. Kathy and I sitting on the beach. The kids are there, but they're off playing by themselves. They're not bothering us, okay? But we're sitting there on the beach, and we're enjoying the sunset. We're enjoying the waves and the ocean. That would be living the good life. You substitute whatever you want to say is the good life there, okay? There's nothing wrong with living the good life. The problem is when we are more concerned with the good life than we are with living a good life. Then we are with following God's commands. We won't be going to Him every morning asking for our daily bread. We'll become content with poor substitutes that this world offers, and our focus shifts. That's what happens to human beings. Instead of our goal being about going out and making disciples, our goals become maintaining safety and comfort. Instead of wanting to see more disciples made, we want to maintain the things that we've got. We want to hold on to the possessions that we have or the situations that we have. Instead of our goal being to strive towards living for Christ, we're living for ourselves. That's the point of the parable of the rich fool, isn't it? Or at least part of it. You remember that story in Luke 12, 13 through 21? There was a man and he had this bumper crop, basically. In fact, he had so much he couldn't fit it in all of his barns. And he said, what am I going to do? And then the idea came to him, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down those barns and I'll build bigger ones and I'll store all this stuff up for myself and I'll have it for many years to come and I'll say to myself, things are great, and I'm paraphrasing here, but things are great, eat, drink, be merry, because I've got everything I need. And the Lord came to him that night and said, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Now who is going to get all this stuff? You see, that's the problem is we become so focused on the stuff, maintaining it, hoarding it, keeping it for ourselves, that we forget about God. That's the message there in Deuteronomy. Go back and look at verses 14 through 16 again. He says there in that passage, actually verses 12 and 13 is what I want to go to. He says, when you've eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, when your herds and flocks multiply, your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you'll forget God. You see, God was the one that was going to give them all this stuff. God was the one leading them into the promised land. God's the one that's given us everything. And yet we get into the mindset that He warned them about. You're going to think that you did it. You're going to think that your hand provided all this, just like the rich fool did. And then you'll forget God. God reminds us daily of the things that He has done for us. He was reminding them here through the words of Moses what He was going to do for them. And He says, don't forget, it's from Me. A second way that God helps us to not forget Him. The first was He told us to keep His commands. The second, we need to remind ourselves of what He's done in our lives. One of the best ways you can talk to someone about God, even share the gospel with them, is not by giving them a lot of religious speak, not saying the, the right words, not sounding like the preacher or the Bible class teacher, but simply telling people what God has done in your life. It's as simple as saying, here's what God's done for me. We sing the words in the song, I was blind, but now I see. We can tell people that. Maybe it's you communicating to someone, you know what, I was an alcoholic or a drug addict, but now I'm free. I was an angry, violent person, but now I've got love and peace in my heart. I was promiscuous, but now I'm faithful. I was an idolater, but now I love Jesus. I once was lost, but now I'm found. What has God done for you? Has He forgiven you? Has He delivered you? Has He changed you? Has He set you free from sin? If you're a Christian, He has. And we need to remind ourselves of those things. And we need to share those things with others. So the Lord is telling us the way we don't forget about God is we keep His commands. We continually remind ourselves of what He's done in our lives and what He's done in history. But then you go on to verse 17 in that passage of Deuteronomy, and He gives us another warning. He says, Beware lest you say in your heart. So it doesn't even have to be with our words. We can have this attitude in our hearts. Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. 
Now that's a sin of pride. That's a sin of saying basically, I don't need God. I can do it on my own and I have done it on my own. That's the attitude. The attitude is we can make it on our own. And again, most people would probably never verbalize that. Most Christians, most believers in God would never come right out and say, I don't need God. But we live our lives that way. We act as though we don't need God. What's in our heart becomes on display in our lives. Did you know that in the New Testament when it talks about Jesus, it refers to Him 24 times as Savior, but over 600 times as Lord. This idea of functional atheism comes from putting yourself on the throne and taking Jesus off of it. But you are not Lord. Jesus is Lord. That means He's your Master. He's the one who is to have control over you. He's the ruler. He's the boss. He owns us. He bought us with a price. And what He says to us in Matthew 16 and verse 24, if anyone would come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. That cross serves one purpose, folks. Death. It is an instrument of death. And Jesus is saying we have to die to sin. We have to die to ourselves. We have to take ourselves off the throne and acknowledge that He is Lord. The purpose of Memorial Day is so that we don't forget what it costs to be free. Now, Memorial Day is different from the 4th of July. On Independence Day, we celebrate our freedom. But on Memorial Day, we should be remembering what freedom costs. But don't think that taking one day out of the year is enough to adequately remember. Those who have lost loved ones in service to our country would tell you that it's not nearly enough. And I'm sure they remember their loved ones every single day. If you stop and think about it, just one day out of the year really is not enough for anything. If you only ate one day out of the year, guess what? You'd die. If you worked at a job and you only worked one day out of the year, you'd more than likely be homeless and have nothing. If you only mowed your grass one day out of the year, guess what? Your yard's going to be an overgrown mess. <clears throat> if you bathe only one day out of the year, I, I don't even want to go there, okay? <laughs> we know one day for most everything is not enough. We have to continually remember. We have to continually remind ourselves. That's why God has established this Lord's Supper memorial that we just partook of a few minutes ago. We do it every week, 52 times a year, so that we can remember. And the reason we do that is because of the example that we have in the New Testament. The disciples gathered on the first day of the week and broke bread. Every week has a first day, and so therefore we gather, we remember every first day of the week. Once a year is not enough. We've got to diligently maintain what we have. Our nation is arguably the greatest nation on earth, but it's not what it used to be. It's got its flaws. It's got its problems. And what's really interesting, if you stop and think about it, if our nation is going to get back to what it once was, it's not going to be about taking up arms, it's not even going to be about voting the right kind of people in. It's not going to be about legislation or politics. It's about what our text says here. It's about remembering God. It's about remembering Jesus as Lord. It's about following Him, obeying Him, and living for Him each and every day. In the last verse of that text, if you look at it, there's a very serious warning there. He says, if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Now then he was talking about those physical idols that people carved and, and these heathen nations bowed down and worshipped to and that they offered sacrifices to. And we say, oh, I would never do anything like that. No, but we've got our idols, don't we? We've got the things that take the place of God in our lives, and that's really what idolatry is. It's when something takes the place of God in our lives, something that is more important. It could be a job. It could be the pursuit of wealth. It could be your own family. It could be yourself. But if we forget God, go after other gods, we will surely perish. 
So this morning I'll leave you with a question. Let's ask ourselves, do we live our lives as if there is no God? Are we functioning atheists? Are we serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are we serving ourselves? Who's seated on the throne of your heart? When we sing that hymn, I surrender all, do we really mean it? When we say that I am surrendering all to you, Jesus, do we really mean it? Maybe you're here this morning, you're saying to yourself, there are things in my life I haven't surrendered to Jesus. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we might admit we're too scared to do that. What if Jesus calls me to do something that's hard? What if he tells me to give up something that I really like doing? What if he calls me to do something that takes me out of my comfort zone? Folks, those are all honest questions. And if we're asking them, we might want to look at verses 12 and 13 of our passage again. And then I would encourage us to remember that our God is good, that He is a loving Father, and that it's so much better to know Him and walk with Him and be in fellowship with Him than it is to be comfortable in this world. And too often that's the choice that we're making. We're choosing our comfort in this world over loving and serving God the way He wants us to. It's so much better to be in His presence and in His will than to have anything this world offers. Because as we said before, this world is temporary. It's passing away. Our time on this earth is finite, but our time in eternity is forever. And there are basically two choices there. Eternity in heaven with God, living with Him for all eternity, serving Him, loving Him, or an eternal punishment in the depths of hell. Those are our choices. We've got to live as though we are remembering God. As though we are not functioning atheists, but we are truly loving and serving Him. So I encourage you this morning, if you need to become a Christian, if you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, make that right this morning. Become His follower. Remember Him. Remember everything He's done for you and that He will do for you. If you've done that in the past and you've wandered away, maybe you find yourself kind of drifting toward that functional atheism. Maybe you find yourself saying, you know what, I haven't really been living for God. I haven't been remembering Him the way that I need to. Make it right this morning. Repent of that sin or any other sin you might have in your life. Ask Him for forgiveness and He will forgive you. If you're here, you just need prayers for strength and for encouragement to live that life. Whatever your need would be, we invite you to come and respond. As together we stand and as we sing.